New York State's borders are more or less defined by the Hudson River Valley and Lake George Champlain Valleys, both sharing mountain views with Vermont to the east and by the St. Lawrence River Valley and Lake Ontario to the north and west, both formidably obvious international zones shared with Canada. The state's southern tier ranges along the hillocks and riverine demarcations shared with Pennsylvania. At its southern region's edge, the Mohawk River Valley is a natural passageway connecting the Atlantic Ocean by way of the Hudson Valley and Albany with Finger Lakes and Great Lakes. The Iroquois Confederacy ruled the beaver and forests throughout the central and northern wilderness regions until the French and Indian Wars and Revolutionary War changed the geographical and political landscape. There are many notable local histories and prominent American personalities that shaped the state's significant participation in the colonial wars and subsequent movements of people and commerce toward the West. Too many to forge a detailed review in this appendix. Some of the key historical threads already have been addressed in previous chapters. As noted, the Dutch enclave at the mouth of the Hudson rapidly became an international port. The river itself piloted traders and settlers north toward Albany and penetrates the high peaks of the Adirondack Mountains wilderness. Its source is a lake tier of the clouds. The route north of New York City along the river is picturesque and wealthy in visual health. Many 19th century artists and landscape painters of the famed Hudson River School turned pastoral settings of the Catskill Mountains and river valleys into luminous portraits. Frederick Edwin Church, a pupil of painter Thomas Cole, lived here along the river in his famous farm retreat, Olana. The property has been preserved as one of Church's works of art.
I visited the estate years ago and was present at the sale of his masterpiece, The Icebergs, in New York City in 1979. The sale price of $2.5 million was at the time the third highest auction of any work of art. Despite the numerous critics of the photographic-like idealism of paintings like churches, I admit that if I had to go to art school, I would go to the Hudson School. Frederick died in 1900. Five years earlier, nearby, Frederick Vanderbilt bought Hyde Park and built a Gilded Age mansion, as the property was known, in 1895. Wealthy New Yorkers had drifted northward over the years to Saratoga and Lake George and even to the Thousand Islands of the St. Lawrence, an escape from the money changers and celebrity salons of the large city on the Atlantic. Far up the Hudson, and a little sideways of the Adirondacks, part of the Laurentian Mountain complex that thrusts into Canada beyond the St. Lawrence River, a miniature sixth great lake resides, Lake Champlain. Champlain links with the St. Lawrence Seaway via the Richelieu River, originally the River of the Iroquois. At its southern end, a canal connects the lake to the Hudson River. Samuel de Champlain, a Frenchman, first encountered and traded with the woodland Iroquois and Abenaki tribes inhabiting opposite sides of the lake. But the British eventually controlled the lake region by the time the Revolutionary War broke out. Fort Ticonderoga experienced a couple of fierce battles in 1758 and 1775. The name Ticonderoga has an Iroquois origin, meaning it is at the junction of two waterways. In 1642, French missionary Isaac Jogues, a priest later killed by indigenous tribal members, was the first white man to traverse the portage at Ticonderoga during a battle between the Iroquois and Huron tribes. In October 1646, the Mohawks killed Jogues, with a tomahawk and threw his body into the Mohawk River near Fort Orange, or Albany, New Netherland. Yogis seems to have been a victim of an anti-French faction of the Iroquois and New England tribes. Unlike the relatively more friendly and cooperative inclinations of natives interacting with and trading with the French in Canada and on the American frontier, 
the Iroquois eventually became stoic allies of the British Loyalists during the War of Independence. Quebec, Canada would early on preside over the fortunes of the primarily French origin settlers in this part of North America. The St. Lawrence River established its ports and transit facilities south to the Great Lakes. Champlain Lake became a strategic naval and cultural dividing line between the French and New England interests as Atlantic Coast pioneers steered themselves across the Green Mountains in what is today the state of Vermont. The Adirondack Mountains stared back in stark beauty and even starker mystery. Samuel Champlain set out from the north with some allied natives to confront the troublesome Mohawks along the fringes of the Adirondacks. The fact that Champlain had a dream in which he saw the Iroquois drowning was considered a most encouraging omen and produced great joy in the camp of the Hurons, the Montagnes, and Algonquins. It is instructive to recite Champlain's own account of his small but lethal skirmish with an Indian party led by three plumed chiefs. His actions in the 17th century in many ways were a model for the future confrontations and behaviors between settlers and Native Americans across the entire continent until the end of the 19th century. When I saw them making move to shoot as, I rested my arquebus against my cheek and aimed directly at one of the three chiefs. With the same shot, two of them fell to the ground, and one of their companions was wounded and afterward died. I put four balls into my arquebus. When our men saw this shot so favorable to them, they began to make cries so loud that one could not have heard it thunder. Meanwhile, the arrows did not fail to fly from both sides. The Iroquois were much astonished that two men had been so quickly killed. Although they were provided with armor woven from cotton thread and from wood, proof against their arrows. This alarmed them greatly. As I was loading again, one of my companions fired a shot from the woods which astonished them again to such a degree that, seeing their chiefs dead, they lost courage, took to flight, and abandoned the field and their fort, fleeing into the depths of the woods. Pursuing them thither, I killed some more of them. Our savages also killed several of them, and took ten or twelve of them prisoners. The rest escaped with the wounded, there were fifteen or sixteen of our men wounded by arrow shots, who were soon healed. After we had gained the victory, they amused themselves by taking a great quantity of Indian corn and meal from their enemies, and also their arms, which they had left in order to run better. And having made good cheer, danced, and sung, we returned three hours afterward with the prisoners. This place where this charge was made is in latitude 43 degrees and some minutes, and I named the lake Lake Champlain.
I quote from another history written by Walter Hill Crockett in 1909. The results of Champlain's battle with the Iroquois are written red in the annals of New France. What appeared to be an unimportant skirmish with a few savages made the powerful Iroquois Confederacy the bitter enemies of the French, an advantage of which the British were not slow to avail themselves and which counted heavily in favor of the latter in the long conflict for supremacy in North America which was to follow. The original Great River of Canada became the St. Lawrence River and later the St. Lawrence Seaway System. It may be the busiest inland water route in North America and is the largest drainage area on the continent behind the Mississippi and Mackenzie Rivers. The 2,300 mile Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway System facilitated the movement of about 158 million metric tons of cargo goods from U.S. ports in 2022. Jacques Cartier is credited with being the first European explorer to investigate the estuaries in the 1530s. The quote, walking river in summer and quote, sliding river in winter was later named by Cartier after the saint of August 10th, St. Laurent. Fur trading and timber markets eventually populated this trench of commerce between the Atlantic Ocean and Lake Ontario and beyond to the other Great Lakes. While today the St. Lawrence is almost taken for granted in the year-to-year -year lore of the northern border of the U.S. and Canada, its vast reach was always a strategic prize for whoever sought to squeeze into New York's and New England's northern mountains and meadows. The natives seemed to have abandoned much of the valley shortly after the first voyageurs, trappers, and traders set up camp, fading across the notoriously bleak Tug Hill Plateau and beneath it the Black River's forested plains and tributaries into the Adirondack wilderness. Today the nearby Thousand Islands of the river is flummoxed by both heavy tanker traffic and tourists frolicking along the shores. Bolt Castle, reportedly purchased for a dollar on Hart Island, which today is part of Alexandria, New York, has never been lived in. Louise, the beloved wife, who was to be gifted with the Gilded Age mansion, died before the completion. With more than a hundred rooms, the soaring symbol of love and extravagance guards the eternal flowing stream. of lakes beyond beckoning adventurers streaming from Europe, the river delivered the goods needed in both directions to keep the traders and militias functional. The Iroquois formed themselves into a formidable quasi-government in the interior. The Algonquin-speaking tribes drifted across the northeastern woodlands alongside the Great Lakes. A Wabanaki Confederacy, though, was not quite a match for the Haudenosaunee League, comprised of Iroquois, Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Mohawk, Oneida, and later Tuscarora.
While the Treaty of 1783 fixed the St. Lawrence River as the boundary line between the United States and Canada, the English continued to occupy Oswegatchie as a trading station, quote, to protect their interests as they climbed. This created great dissatisfaction on the part of the Americans, but it was remedied finally by the Jay Treaty, which stipulated that all English posts in the U.S. should be abandoned on or before June 1, 1796. Further south, along the shores of the Lake Ontario, Quaint and relatively humble towns reflect an upstate New York that is not so well known or extravagant. Sackett's Harbor probably is the most crucial port along this stretch of lakeshore, as it was a core military and shipbuilding hub at one time, especially supplying the force and material leading to the defeat of the British along the northern U.S. frontier in the War of 1812. The south shore of Lake Ontario extends sharply westward to the eastern edge of the next great lake, Lake Erie. Buffalo, New York, resides here alongside the notorious Niagara Falls. In the 18th century, Seneca land along Buffalo Creek was ceded through the Holland Land Purchase. In 1825, Buffalo was selected as the end point of the Erie Canal, which led to its incorporation in 1832. The city in the 19th century served as one of the country's largest grain transshipment ports and later as a key railroad hub connecting the Great Lakes and the Atlantic Ocean. The history of this once sparsely inhabited region is complex, but crucial to the ultimate movement and settlement of the Dutch, French, and English westward into Pennsylvania and the Ohio country. After the Treaty of Big Tree removed Iroquois title to the lands west of the Genesee River in 1797, Joseph Ellicott surveyed the land at the mouth of Buffalo Creek. The small settlement of foreigners, originally named New Amsterdam, later changed its name to Buffalo. The Buffalo-Niagara district remains New York State's second largest metropolitan area after New York City. Niagara Falls and Gorge drains Lake Erie into Lake Ontario. Theodosia Burr Alston, the daughter of Vice President Aaron Burr, honeymoon with husband Joseph Alston in 1801. The only recorded freeze-up of both the river and the falls was caused by an ice jam in March 1848. The flow dropped to a trickle for up to 40 hours, it was reported. Interestingly, a conservation movement named Free Niagara, including Hudson River School artist Frederick Edwin Church, living in Atlanta, Landscape designer Frederick Law Olmsted and architect Henry Hobson Richardson helped trigger a Canadian-U.S. discussion and eventual enactment of plans to make the falls, Go Island, and surrounding area a public park. The Niagara Reservation was New York's first state park established in 1885. The province of Ontario authorized a Canadian park for the same purpose in the same year.
my own photographs can't match the realism of Church's painting. Dated 1857, 